Okay, hello, this is the second part of the chapter on organic chemistry. So let us review starting from esters and then we'll continue to the end of the chapter. So remember we were talking about esters. Have you studied these esters? Do you understand now how to write the name? So what was the name of this one? We said the first part that has the C double bond O, O that was the acid. So this acid has two carbons. And then the part that is after the O, the single bond O, that is the alcohol. So the alcohol here has one carbon and we said the name starts with the name of the alcohol. So this carbon has, this uh, alcohol has one carbon. That means that the name is methyl something. And then we said the acid has two carbons. That means it is ethanoate. That's how we name esters. Have you understood this? Let's name this again. Do you remember how to name this? This was what? The part after the single bond O has two carbons. So that should be ethyl something. Now the part that has the C double bond O, that was the acid. And that's just one carbon. So this is ethyl methanoate. Okay? This one was what? Ethyl ethanoate. What about this one? Do you remember this? Okay, so the part after the single bond O has two carbons. That means it is ethyl butanoate. Okay, now the part that we need to continue with is dealing with polymers. Polymers, the word polymer in chemistry is basically what we call plastics at home. But in chemistry, we call them polymers. So polymers are large molecules. A polymer is a typically a long chain molecule made by joining many small molecules together. So polymers are macromolecules or large molecules that were made by joining many small molecules together. Now each of these small molecules that are joined together is called a monomer. So monomers are the small molecules that can be joined together to ma make a long chain. Polymerization is the process of making polymers. So it is the process of joining many small molecules together to form a long chain molecule. All definitions should be memorized and you should not have any problem with any definition. Okay. We said polymers are basically what we call plastic. So if he says what is the use of polymer, don't say to make plastic. Because polymer is plastic. Now, what do we use plastic for? Or what do we use polymers for? We use them in making plastic bags, plastic bottles, plastic robes, plastic toys, anything that you can think of. What are the problems of using polymers? Now, the pro first problem is that polymers are, in most cases, non-biodegradable. Now, the word biodegradable means can be broken down by bacteria. You know that most of our garbage that we throw away are remains of food, remains of clothing or whatever. These are what we call biodegradable. That means if I throw them in the garbage, uh, the bacteria in the soil will break them up into very tiny uh, molecules that can be absorbed into the soil. So we call these biodegradable. Now polymers are not like that. We say polymers are non-biodegradable that means they cannot be broken down by bacteria and that means they accumulate in dump sites so when they're thrown away they just stay there they're not broken down into smaller molecules and disappear now even if we try to burn the polymers that's not a good idea either because when burnt they release toxic gases Okay, so these are the two problems of the use of polymers. Now, if he wants a third one, which usually we, he doesn't ask for, but if he asks for a third one, then presence of polymers in the environment is not very good because uh, small animals can be trapped in them and uh, die. Okay, how do we draw a polymer? First of all, there are two types of polymers. The first type is what we call an addition polymer. And addition polymers have to start with alkenes. So the monomer for an addition polymer has to be an alkene. And you remember that an alkene is something that has a double bond. So if he gives me an alkene, so let's say ethene, and he says draw the polymer. Now, 
that means that I have many, many, many mo molecules of ethene and I'm trying to join them all together to form a long chain. Now, you know that each carbon atom cannot have more than four bonds. So in order to join this to another molecule before it and another molecule after it, I need, first of all, to break the double bond into a single bond. So I look for where is the double bond between the two carbons. I turn it into a single bond because I'm going to make a bond to join to a molecule after and a bond to join to a molecule before. And then I put this between bracket and write a small n to indicate that this is just a part that has been repeated many, many, many times. I don't know how many times, so I just write n. So n is just the number of molecules of these that are being joined together. Then I look at each carbon. What was it bonded to? And I write the same thing. So in this case, the first carbon was bonded to a hydrogen and a hydrogen. So I bonded to a hydrogen and a hydrogen. The second carbon was the same. So I bonded to a hydrogen and a hydrogen. Now, the name of my polymer is called poly whatever I started with. So if I started with ethene, then my polymer formed from it is called poly exactly the same name polyethene even though it no longer has a double bond it's not something that has a double bond remember that the polymer is now an alkene not an alkene but the name indicates that this polymer was made from ethene so we call it polyethene okay let's try another one now if he says draw the polymer of propene that means i have many many propene molecules that i'm going to join together to form a polymer now how am I going to join them? I'm going to join them from the two carbons that had the double bond. Can you see the two carbons that have the double bond? Now I'm going to join all the molecules from one of these carbons and from the other one. So that double bond changes into a single bond. And then I take a look. Each carbon was bonded to what? So the double bond becomes a single bond. I a bond after and a bond before and I put the bracket and end. And then I take a look. Each carbon was bonded to what? Now, that first carbon had a bond going to hydrogen and a bond going to hydrogen. So I draw that. Now, the second carbon that is at the other end of the double bond was bonded to what? It, was, it has a bond going to hydrogen. I draw that. And it has a bond going to a carbon that has three hydrogens. So I write it going to a carbon that has three hydrogens. Can you see how we do this? So we don't just write the three carbons after each other and just join. We are joining from the two carbons that have the double bond. Again, if the monomer is called propene, then the polymer is called polypropene. Let's try 1-butene. Now, this is how we draw 1-butene. Now, if I want the polymer of that, again, I just look at the two carbons that have the double bond between them. I draw it with a single bond, a bond after, a bond before, bracket N. Have we drawn that? And then, the first carbon has a bond going to hydrogen and another bond going to hydrogen. I draw that. Now, the second carbon has bonds going to what? It has a bond going to hydrogen and another bond going to two carbons with five hydrogens. Can you see that? And again, if the monomer is 1-butene or but1-ene, remember that we said 1-butene can be called but1-ene, then the polymer will be poly, exactly the same name. So poly 1-butene or poly but one Okay. Okay, let's try another one. So another one would be but 2 in. So but 2 in has a double bond between the two carbons in the middle. That's what I look at. I copy it with a single bond. In the middle, a bond on this side, a bond on this side, brackets, and N. And then I take a look. Each carbon was bonded to what? Now, the carbon on the left side of the double bond had one bond going to hydrogen and another bond going to a carbon with three hydrogens. I draw that. Now, the carbon on the other side of the double bond had, again, a bond going to hydrogen and a bond going to carbon that is attached to three hydrogens. So, that is your but 2 in its polymer would be called poly, exactly the same name. 
Then, remember that all these polymers that started with a double bond or an alkene were called addition polymers. Now, this is another type of polymer which we call condensation polymer. In this case, the monomers are not alkenes. The monomers are molecules that have active groups on both ends. Active groups on both ends means a group on, on each end that can react with something else. So, in this case, in condensation polymers, the monomers have active groups on both ends. And then, I, that means that I have one with two acids on its end. So, that's called the diacid. Another one that has two alcohols on its end. So this is called a diol or a dialcohol. And I have many, many, many of these. So I have a diacid, a dialcohol, a diacid, a dialcohol, a diacid, a dialcohol, and so on. <clears throat> and I'm trying to join them all together to form a long chain. Now, in order to join these molecules together, I need to remove something from the first one, something from the second one, and join. So what am I removing? From the acid, th remember this is just like making esters. Do you remember how we made esters? We remove acid, the acid will remove OH from it. And the alcohol, I will remove an H. That means I removed an H from one and OH from the other. That means I'm basically removing a molecule of water. And then I join together, okay? Join it, the C double bond O, directly to the O of the alcohol. And then on the ends, I do the same thing because after the alcohol, there is another acid on the other end. So I'm going to remove the H from the alcohol and the OH from the acid to join them to other molecules. So this would be my polymer. Now, this type of polymer is called a polyester. So when he says draw a polyester, you are required to draw that organic compound. C double bond O box, C double bond O, O box O. That's my polyester. Now, an example of a polyester is terylene. So, if he says draw terylene, I still draw the same molecule that you have there. Do we understand? Now, in some cases, he will not tell you draw a polyester or he will not tell you draw terylene. He will give you two specific molecules and tell you to join them to form a long chain. So, instead of that box in the middle, can you see the box? This box indicates anything. I don't know, it doesn't matter what is in there. If he writes a box, you copy it as a box. If he writes it as something, CH2, 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 C6, H5, whatever, you copy it as it is. It doesn't matter what is in that place that I draw a box as. That box is just copied as it is, and what you care about is the one at the end. So at the end, you have an acid, you remove the OH from it. On the other end, you have an alcohol, you remove the H from it, and you join. Okay, so that means that we have talked about two types of polymerization, addition polymerization and condensation polymerization. Addition is the one that has monomers that are unsaturated or alkenes or have C double bond C. And remember that in that case, my polymer was the only product. But in condensation polymerization, my monomers, the ones I started with, had functional groups on both ends or active groups on both ends. And when I joined them together, I had to remove a small molecule. For example, I removed H from one, set, uh, uh, one end and OH from the other, and that means I removed a molecule of water. Okay, so let's try some questions that you might uh, meet. So this question says, what type of polymers are polyethene and polychloroethene? Now we said polyethene means you're starting with an alkene. And when you start with an alkene, the type of polymer is an addition polymer. Now complete the diagram to show the displayed formula of polychloroethene. So let's take a look. What do you think is chloroethene? Chloroethene is something like this. Ethene has two carbons with a double bond in the middle. It should have hydrogens all around, but if he says chloroethene, that means one of the hydrogens is replaced by a chlorine. Now, he's telling me to draw the uh, polymer of this, and we said to draw the polymer of anything. What should we do? The two carbons that had the double bond, I write them with a single bond. And I put bonds from either end to indicate that I'm joining it to molecules after and before. 
and I put an N outside the bracket to indicate that this part is being repeated many, many times. And then I see each carbon was bonded to what? The first carbon is bonded to H and H, so I draw that, and the second carbon is bonded to H and Cr. Explain how an addition polymer is formed from its monomers. Now, what did we do to change the monomer into a polymer? Remember, the first thing we did was break the double bond and make it into a single bond, and then make new single bonds to join two molecules after and before. So, what we did is the C double bond C in the monomer is broken to form a C single bond C, and then new single bonds are formed between the monomers to form a long chain or to join them together into a long chain. Okay, another possible question. Chloroethene can be used to manufacture the polymer PVC. What do you think is the name of PVC if, um, ah, okay, the, poly, the PVC is actually Poly, polymer of that. So the polymer is called poly, that's name that he gave you. So if he gives you chloroethene, then the PVC must be the uh, name for polo, polychloroethene. Actually, the, it, it's called PVC because the chloroethene has another name, which is vinyl chloride. So the polymer is actually, PVC actually stands for pol, polyvinyl chloride. Okay, let's take a look at the next question. So, write an equation containing displayed formula to represent the reaction that occurs in the manufacture of PVC. He says to manufacture PVC, you start with chloroethene and you change it into a polymer. So, how do you write that as an equation? The chloroethene you draw. And then we said we have many, many of them. That means we have N of them, N molecules of chloroethene. And then when we joined them together, we made the polymer by opening the double bond into a single bond, bond from this end and bond from the other end. And then you write the original uh, atoms that were present with an N outside the bracket. So you have an N outside the bracket to indicate that this part is repeated n times, that means you must have started with n number of molecules that are being joined together. Okay, the other thing that we need to talk about is fuels. Fuel is any flammable substance that burns in oxygen to release heat in an exothermic reaction. So a fuel is something that you burn. It has to be flammable in order to burn. So if something burns, we call it flammable. Now, it burns, usually it will burn in oxygen to release energy. So we said before that any uh, reaction that gives out heat is an exothermic reaction. So fuels will always burn in exothermic reactions to release heat or to release energy. Now, what are the types of fuel? The first type is what we call fossil fuel. And fossil fuel is the flammable substance that is obtained from remains of decayed plants and animals. So the word fossils, remember, means decayed plants and animals. Now, the remains of that changes usually into fuel, so we call that fossil fuel. Now, we have many examples of fossil fuel, solid, liquid, or gaseous fossil fuel. And you have to remember an example of each. So a solid fossil fuel like coal. Remember that coal is made from uh, remains of decayed trees or, or decayed plants. Um, a liquid fossil fuel would be crude oil. And remember that the word crude oil is the same as petroleum. And remember that petroleum is actually made from decayed animals at the bottom of the sea that remained for millions of years and that changed into petroleum. Gaseous fossil fuel, that's example of that, is natural gas or methane. Remember that we said that natural gas is ma mainly made up of methane. So these are fossil fuels. The other types of fuels 
could be something like uranium. Remember when we were talking about radioactive isotopes? When we talked about radioactive isotopes, we said an example of radioactive isotope is uranium-235. Now, uranium-235 is regarded as a fuel because it is used to produce energy nuclear power stations. But remember that this is one fuel that does not burn in oxygen. To release the energy. So if he says fuels that burn in oxygen, yes, all fossil fuels, you need to burn them in oxygen in order to release energy. Uranium is the only fuel that we're going to talk about that does not burn in order to release energy. It releases the energy uh, by nuclear reactions. And that, and that's something completely different. So just remember that uranium-235 does not burn in oxygen. It's a fuel, but it does not burn in oxygen. Now, hydrogen gas is another fuel, and it does burn in oxygen. And when it burns in oxygen, that means I have just hydrogen plus oxygen. Hydrogen plus oxygen will just give water. So one of the advantages of having hydrogen gas as a fuel is that it does not cause any pollution. Its only product is water vapor. And uh, uh, in this case, you can say it is used as a fuel in rockets, or if he asks for another one, we use it to make ammonia. Remember that to make ammonia, nitrogen plus hydrogen gives ammonia. So this is one use of hydrogen. Okay, how do we get organic compounds? All organic compounds are obtained from petroleum. So if you're asked what is the source of organic compounds, it is petroleum. Now, how do I get organic compounds from petroleum? I do this by two processes. The first process is fractional distillation of crude oil. If you remember, fractional distillation means separation of a mixture of liquids by heating them and then condensing at different boiling points. That's what we said when we were talking about fractional distillation. So in this case, crude oil or petroleum, you should know, is actually a mixture of liquids. So you're trying to separate a mixture of liquids, you do fractional distillation. But in this case, you don't use a condenser. Well, this is on a very large scale. So you use a huge column, which we call fractionating column. So the crude oil passes from below. It is heated, vaporized, and then it goes up the fractionating column. It is cooled and condensed in the fractionating column or the fractionating tower to give different fractions at different boiling points. Now, you have to remember that whatever is collected at the top of the fractionating column is the one that has lower number of carbons, lower boiling point. It is less viscous. Do you know the meaning of viscous? Viscous means thick. So we say, for example, honey is viscous, water is less viscous. So something that is viscous means it is thick, flows slowly. So the ones collected at the top are the ones that have lower number of carbons, lower boiling point. It is less viscous, but it is more flammable. So these are the ones that are used as fuel. The ones collected at the bottom of the fractionating column are the ones that have higher boiling point, so they have more number of carbons, they are more viscous, and they are less flammable. You need to know the order in which they're collected and the use for each one. So the ones at the top are called refinery gases. So these are, for example, the buta gas that we used as bottled gas for heating and cooking. So the first one is refinery gas, used as heat or used for heating and cooking. The second one is gasoline, and gasoline is the one we put in our cars, the fuel that we put in our cars. Kerosene is fuel that is used for either jets, airplanes, or for lighting and heating. Some heaters use kerosene. Diesel, diesel oil is used for diesel engines or trains, so this is fuel for diesel engines. Don't just say for, for diesel engines, for airplanes, no. Kerosene is used as fuel for jets or jet fuel. Diesel is used as fuel for diesel engines. Uh, fuel oil is used as fuel for ships. And then the last one there is butamine. And butamine is that black stuff that they used for road making. Okay. Now, once we have separated these things, then we do cracking of them. So in this case, we have separated the petroleum to form all different types of alkenes. 
but these are usually long chain alkanes now we need to break them up into smaller chains and if you remember when we talked about the reactions of alkanes we said one of the reactions was cracking and cracking is what is breakdown of long chain hydrocarbons into shorter chains what were the conditions 600 to 700 degrees centigrade and aluminium oxide catalyst or alumina and we said I start with something that has many carbons I break it up into sh uh, smaller molecules one of them has to be an alkene and the other one will be the rest of the carbons and the rest of the hydrogen so that would be an alkene now why do we do this this cracking this process of cracking of the products that come out from the fractional distillation of petroleum is very important because this cracking produces shorter chain hydrocarbons and the shorter chain hydrocarbons are more useful and more in demand the also the shorter chain hydrocarbons are have higher prices so this is more profitable economically uh, in all, uh, another uh, uh, advantage is that usually it will give ethene and ethene is very important to make polymers and to make ethanol remember that we said the ethene if I join it together it forms polyethene and that is the plastic that we use in many cases and when I add water to ethene it makes ethanol and we said ethanol is what we call alcohol or beer and this is what uh, and this is used as uh, uh, alcoholic drink or as a few uh, as a fuel or as a solvent okay so this is a possible question that you would see he gives you a diagram that shows a column used in industrial process to separate crude oil now name the process used to separate crude oil we said this process is called fractional distillation and then you have to remember we said we have to remember the uses of each fraction so he wants you to write the use of kerosene and the use of butamine do you remember from what we said kerosene was fuel for jets and butamine was made was used for road making another possible question which property of hydrocarbons is used to separate crude oil into fractions when we separate crude oil into fractions we said we use fractional distillation and fractional distillation separates the liquids based on difference in what based on difference in boiling point so my answer is a name the catalyst used in industrial cracking what is the catalyst that we use for cracking you have to remember all the conditions for an, any of these things catalyst used for cracking we said aluminium oxide or you can write alumina <clears throat> what is the temperature used in industrial cracking we said cracking occurs at which temperature 600 to 700 degrees centigrade please remember the conditions now the next question says tetradecane can be cracked to make ethene and only one other hydrocarbon write a chemical equation for this reaction so he's telling you i'm starting with tetra tetradecane so i'm starting with c14h30 now i'm going to break it up so that's arrow to give what to give c2h4 plus the rest so if i'm starting with c14 i removed c2 i'm left with c12 if i'm starting with h30 i removed 4 I end with 26 this is another possible question crude oil is a mixture of organic compounds a teacher decides to separate a sample of crude oil into some fractions the table shows the range of boiling points for the fractions collected by the teacher so he gives you a range of boiling points are you with me so let's try and answer this question identify the fraction that is the least viscous we said the one that is the least viscous is the one that has low boiling point or high boiling point <clears throat> remember we said in the fractionating column the one at the very top always remember that the one at the very top has what low number of carbons low boiling point low viscosity so the one that is least viscous is the one that has the lower boiling point now identify the fraction that contains compounds with the smallest molecules again we said the ones collected at the top of the fractionating column are the ones with what less number of carbons and these are the ones that have less boiling point so the one that has less boiling point is the one that has the smaller molecule or the less number 
of carbons. Okay, another possible question, crude oil is a liquid that contains a mixture of many hydrocarbons. The diagram shows a fractionating column used in the distillation of crude oil. The six fractions obtained are shown. One use of each of four of the fractions is also shown. Now, describe what is done to the crude oil before it enters the fractionating column. Do you remember what we do to the crude oil before it enters the fractionating column? We heat it. So it is heated until it is vaporized. State how the temperature changes from the top of the column to the bottom. So uh, from the top to the bottom, what is happening to the temperature? From top to bottom, the temperature increases. We said the ones at the top have lower temperature. The ones at the bottom have higher temperature. Another possible question. The passage is about fractional distillation of crude oil. Use words from the box to complete the passage. And in most of these types of questions, you may use each word once, more than once, or not at all. So the crude oil is heated so that vaporization occurs. Then the column has a... Do you, know, do you know the meaning of gradient? Gradient means something that's gradually changing. What is gradually changing in the column? The temperature. So it has a temperature gradient. The compounds in the crude oil pass up the column and ha what happens to them? The molecules that have been separated in the column, they will go up the column and will condense. So condensation occurs at different heights depending on the, on the boiling point. We said they are separated based on differences in boiling point. A lot, another question that you might see, he says, please tick in the boxes to show the three correct statements about cracking. So first of all, the molecules that are cracked are hydrocarbons. Is that right? We said, what do we do cracking for? Hydrocarbons? Yes, of course. We said cracking is what? If I say what is the definition of cracking, it is the breakdown of long chain hydrocarbons into shorter chains. Now, catalytic cracking using iron as a catalyst. Was iron the catalyst for cracking? No. Do you remember what was the catalyst for cracking? The catalyst for cracking was aluminium oxide or alumina. Now, cracking is used because of different demands for hydrocarbons. Yes, we said some hydrocarbons are uh, have more demand, more economical, more profitable, and so on. Cracking reactions are examples of addition. Do you remember what was addition? Actually, addition is the opposite of cracking. Addition means you join something. Cracking means you break it up. So, cracking is not an example of addition. Okay, cracking produces molecules with shorter chains. Yes, it is the breakdown of long chain hydrocarbons into shorter chains. Now, the last one says this equation is an equation for cracking. Is it? Cracking is what? Is the breakdown of long chain hydrocarbons into shorter chain. Not reaction with oxygen. And remember reaction was, with oxygen was called what? Reaction with oxygen was called combustion. Okay? Now, let's try an experiment. He might tell you to try an experiment to compare energy values of fuels. That means he's going to tell you that I have two fuels. Let's say, for example, methanol and ethanol. And I want to know which one is a better fuel. The one that is a better fuel is the one that will give more heat. So how do I know if something has given more heat? I'm going to use it to heat up a certain amount of water. The one that will raise the temperature to, of the water to a higher temperature would be the better fuel. And we said in order to compare something, you need to measure. First of all, in order to compare something, you need to measure what you're using. So let us say 30 centimeter cubed or 25 centimeter cubed as shown in the um, uh, diagram. So it should be actually measured 25 centimeter cubed or 30 centimeter cubed, doesn't matter, into a test tube using what? Remember that when you explain these things, you tell me the um, apparatus that you use. So in order to put water into the test tube, you need to measure how much, but not it doesn't have to be exact, very, very exact. So we use a measuring cylinder. And then what am I going to measure? I'm going to measure the initial temperature of the water using a thermometer. And then I'm going to put a specific mass of the first fuel. So I'm going to 
weigh for example 25 grams of the first fuel in a spirit burner using a balance and then i place the burner below the test tube light it allow it to heat the water for a specific amount uh, of time for example five minutes note the final temperature of the water i repeat this using the same mass of the other fuel so if i started with 25 i need to use also 25 of the other fuel and the same volume of water remember when you're explaining these experiments you have to tell me what is kept the same in order to be able to compare them so in this case i need the same mass of fuel and i need the same volume of water for the same amount of time for five minutes for example and then determine the final temperature of the water the fuel that causes a higher increase in the temperature of the water would be the better fuel do we understand that so that's the end of organic i want you to go and study this chapter very well go over the video as many times as you need to uh, study the notes try the questions and in the next lesson we will discuss the questions and their answers okay this is a very important chapter so please study hard for this chapter